What's interesting is that while the US yield curve is deeply negative, there are other developed countries out there that do not. They actually have a positive uh, twos and tens yield curve. I don't know if you guys have any opinions on that. And then I'd just love to dive into um, you know, your thoughts on the inversion of the yield curve and what a bear sleepner could mean. The thing when I look at, at other developed economies um, and I look at their yield curves, like the twos, tens part of it is not as interesting to me as where the twos are relative to target rates. And so you look at Europe mm. and you see a circumstance where they're running five to six percent inflation. Their target rate, you know, is four, give or take, you know, and the two year rate is priced in at three. Like what's like what's going on there? That's an inflation mandate, an inflation targeting central bank that is failing to meet its mandate and not like kind of failing to meet its mandate, like brutally failing, like desperately failing to meet its mandate. And what the market's pricing in is hundreds of basis points of cuts relatively shortly. Um, and of course, you'd ex typically expect growth to, uh, to, to weaken in response to the tightening. And you have seen some weakening in overall economic conditions in a place like Europe. Um, but it's just, it's not, it's not enough. And I think that's really the that's really the 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 challenge here as we scan across all these central banks. And really, I mean, basically, all the central banks in the world have capitulated, right? They're all at pause or close to pause, right? That's that's basically how they've settled out what's going on at a time when in no central bank, no major developed central bank has inflation fallen to their target. Certainly not in in a way that has been long enough to for them to dur to believe that it's down there durably, right? And I think that is that's the very interesting tension point. So when I look at some of these other economies, particularly on the short end, I see a real gap between uh, how low the two year point of the cycle is relative to the target rate, um, and see that gap suggesting that even if they hold, you know, flat for a while, right, which would be like probably imprudent, but at least at least a reasonable path, like a, a plausible path that they would pursue, even if a bit imprudent. Um, you know, that's not that's gonna get a lot of cuts priced out of those short end markets. And I think probably put pressure uh, you know, necessarily on on the longer parts of the curve since the short end is it is in the long end to some extent. And so I think that's kind of what's interesting to me is this sort of big global central bank bet on pause. Hmm. At a time like, um, you know, where, I, you know, I asked this question on, on Twitter a couple of days ago. It was basically like, is it, is it, you know, is that going to be the bigger mistake of this cycle, right? Is, is the pause going to be the bigger mistake than the bet on transitory, right? Because it's the pause that could create entrenchment. And so that's, you know, the markets are not reflecting even a extended pause, let alone the need to do more work to bring those inflation pressures down. By and large, my thinking on Europe is that um, the underperformance of bonds relative to stocks is almost more extreme than it is anywhere else on the globe. Like bonds have just, can, and they had, and for good reason, bonds were yielding zero. And so they had a lot of room to underperform. And I'm, re I'm coming to a point where I think long-term bonds relative to um, European equities are probably um, a good buy. But I, And I also think, to echo your point, that another decent idea is um, buying long-term bonds and selling two-year bonds. Because while we are not as inverted, it, we're more inverted in the U.S., perhaps we'll get quite a bit more inverted in uh, the um, European markets. Now, the UK is a little narrower because it, until recently, was expecting lots and lots of hikes. But again, they've also sort of come in. Yeah, that, that's come in mostly. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, that's... But, the, but Europe is, you know, Germany is, um, you know, could see some significant further in, um, inversion, in my opinion. But it may pivot around fives and leave tens fairly cheap. So I'm looking at that as an interesting 
play, particularly uh, against a short in uh, Euro stocks or DAX. I like that trade uh, there, the, the putting it against the stocks, because in many ways, the bond market has reflected the meaningful, like has reflected at least some meaningful repricing of of the, of the value of money that's necessary, uh, the value of cash that's necessary uh, in in Europe to fight the inflationary pressures that they have, but stocks have not at all, right? Like where we you know we're basically at highs, right? Um, uh, which is kind of incredible to think that that's how it's getting priced now. You know, the, there's some global dynamics going on there too because a lot of those companies are global in nature. But but the but the gist of the point that you're saying I think is quite compelling, which is that. Um, you know, is that relative to bonds, it is, uh, it is less of a compelling story. I think one of the things though, when I look at the European markets and maybe, maybe really when I look at the UK market in particular, which again, UK stocks, very important to recognize UK stocks are global in nature that are not predominantly, um, you know, domestically oriented in the United right. Kingdom. But what I do see is meaningful differences in the pricing between U.S. stocks and a number of uh, in the stocks in those a number of those other uh, economies. So if you look at like U.K. stocks, uh, I I had a tweet about this uh, a couple of days ago. You know, you're you're looking at like earnings yields that are you know close to double what they are in the U.S. You know what that what does that imply? You know, you have U.S. companies are global in nature. U.K. companies are mostly global in nature. Obviously, there's more tilting towards the U.S. and U.S. stocks, but like. You know, you've got a pretty wild divergence there in terms of the pricing that's been a function of a number of different things, you know, just people interest, you know, trend following US stocks plus the dollar being strong, et cetera. But it's created like a pretty remarkable difference in the pricing across developed stock markets. And so, um, you know, that we're just talking through a complicated set of trades, but this idea of, um, you know, holding uh foreign foreign stocks and particularly like UK stocks and other places relative to US seems pretty interesting in this environment. Yeah, I haven't thought of that one. That's a good one. 